الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الأمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد All praise is due to Allah The Lord of everything And we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah He is the helper and the protector of the righteous and we bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mansion and grant him peace and send his salutations and his blessings upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. All you who have believed, fear Allah and be mindful of him and say that which is straight and correct. Allah will forgive you your sins and rectify your affairs and whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger has already attained the greatest form of success. Brothers in faith, in our relationship with Allah, there are certain areas of it that are abstract. Abstract in a sense, that they don't involve a physical ritual. And there are some which are obviously a combination of both. So when we speak about a person worshipping Allah or when you think of the word worship, what might come to mind is a, play, a person in the state of sujood, prostration, a person doing tawaf around the Kaaba, a person involved in some act of worship. But the truth of the matter is that worship is far greater than that. And its depth is beyond that. In fact, those outwardly acts of worship, the ritual part, if they're missing the core and the substance which gives them life, they are useless and invalid. What Islam focuses on the most is what we hold within our hearts. Which should translate externally. And not the other way around. And when we speak about the areas where one can define his relationship with Allah, if each one of us were to have a self-assessment test, where do I stand? What is my position? What is my status? Who am I in the sight of Allah? How do I really know my Lord? How do I worship Him? What are the feelings that run within me in regards to my Creator? There will be many different topics we could address. But today we want to highlight a very specific one, which is often misunderstood by the Muslims. And we try to make it a point to address from this member the issues that we deal with on daily basis so that the khutbah can be useful and fruitful. And we can mention many historical lessons from the past wherein we continue to live in the past but if that does not have an impact on today, then it doesn't get us anywhere. And the concept is husnul dhanni billah. And it can also be su'u dhanni billah. 
a good assumption about Allah or an evil assumption about Allah. What does that really mean? And how do we know under which category we, we fit? We first have to understand the principles. The principle is based on a Hadith Qudsi. And a Hadith Qudsi, unlike the standard Hadith, is one wherein the Prophet وسلم, narrates on behalf of Allah, but it is not an ayah in the Quran. Meaning it's the words of Allah, but narrated by the Prophet However, it's different than the speech of Allah which you find in the Kitab, in the Quran. So the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah said, Ana عِنْدَ ظَنِّ عَبْدِي بِي I am whatever my slave thinks of me. Which means, if we were to think good about Allah, then you should expect good. And if you were to assume good about Allah, bad about Allah, then you should expect bad. And anyone with his, in his right mind, would definitely not want to be in the area of assuming things bad about Allah. Because that's a lose-lose situation right there. That's a guaranteed loss for that person. However, when we speak about good assumption, some still don't understand what does that mean? How? How does that translate in my behavior? The scholars break it down into areas, the first of which is dua. Dua or supplication is one context where you, as, you are supposed to have good assumption about Allah. The Prophet wasallam said, if you make dua, it will be accepted Unless one of you hastens, he becomes hasty and he says, I made dua, nothing happened. And this is the condition of many. So we have a person that already wants an immediate response from Allah. Because in his mind, his dua should be and translated into action instantaneously. When that does not happen, then he starts whining and complaining that I've been asking for this for so long but nothing ever happened. You will remain to be in a good state until you reach this point. Once you start thinking that I did but nothing happened, you are now in the state of loss. Because that negates the concept of dua. And a lot of people are in this condition because there's one hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is crucial in understanding the matter of dua. If one were to understand it, this confusion would be gone insha'Allah. And this is the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there isn't a Muslim who makes dua to Allah, provided that it does not entail ithm, sinfulness. Because if someone may make a dua for something sinful, or it doesn't entail severing of the kinship ties. No Muslims make any dua, any dua to Allah, provided that they avoid sin in their dua. And of course, we've mentioned many times before, the act of screaming one's lungs out in the dua is an ithm in the dua, is one of the areas where one falls into sinfulness in the dua. Because Allah commanded us in the Quran that when it comes to dua, ud'u rabbakum khufyan, khufyatan wa tadarru'an. In more than one ayah, call on your Lord in secret and in humbleness. Allah Azza wa Jal hears all sounds simultaneously. He doesn't need an imam to scream so loud and everybody to scream ameen behind him for the dua to be registered with Allah. 
This is from the bid'ah and from the ignorance that is widespread in the ummah. And everybody claps for them. And everybody gets involved. And I've spoken about this many times. It's about time that the imams know their position. When you want to make dua, calm down. This is the time to calm down. Allah hears you. Otherwise, this is a ta'addi fi dua. This is transgression in dua. Or someone says, Oh Allah, destroy all the disbelievers. Ya akhi, Allah decreed that they will be believers and disbelievers until yawm al qiyamah. Yani, where do you want everyone to go? You're not Nuh alayhi salam during his time after Allah already informed him that no one will believe for him to say that oh Allah don't leave upon the earth any kafir. There are a lot of areas where people are just ignorant. They just repeat things like parrots. And they're actually transgressing against Allah in the dua. And such dua will not be accepted. But they don't pay attention. Al-Muhim, once you avoid severing the kinship ties and sinfulness in the dua, one of three things will happen. Guaranteed. You're a Muslim. You make dua, one of three things will happen. Either you will be given what you're asking for. Allah will give it to you in the dunya. Or it will be stored for him until Yawm al Qiyamah, until the Akhirah. Allah will not give it to you now. But you will be rewarded accordingly on the last day, according to Allah's wisdom. Or that Allah will alleviate the calamity that was going to befall you, equivalent to this dua of yours. Once you understand that, you can't possibly have bad assumption about Allah. Nor can you say, I made dua, nothing happened. Because brother, something happened, you just don't know. It could be that Allah knows this is not good for you now. And so Allah will store this for you until Yawm Al Qiyamah. Or it could be that something else was going to befall you, which you never knew about. And Allah removed it by virtue of your dua. It does not mean everything you ask for will be given to you exactly as you want it. In fact, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah says this negates contentment. A slave who's like almost commanding Allah, almost imposing on Allah what He wants, such as being with a particular person, being with a particular person, or that you want to become rich, or that you want Allah to alleviate this calamity of yours, not knowing whether this is actually what Allah would be pleased with for you. Ibn Qayyim goes to the point of saying that you shouldn't even ask for things like that. Because it's almost like you're assuming that this is going to be good for you, so you ask in Allah for it, even though Allah might give it to you, and it might be bad. So the better state is that you ask Allah for whatever is good for you. You let Allah decide on your behalf. You don't make these decisions. But that requires a level of Iman that not all of us enjoy. We ask Allah to make us among those who reach that level. That level of contentment with whatever Allah facilitates for them and decrees for them. So in the context of dua, my brother in faith, you have to know. Your Lord has proclaimed, make dua, call on me, I will respond to you. And when my slaves ask you about me, I am near. I respond to the supplication of the person when he supplicates. So whenever you make dua to Allah, as long as we follow in the etiquettes of making dua and avoiding sinfulness and transgression in dua, then rest assured that you are in good shape. You are in good shape and assume nothing but good about Allah. Woe to you from assuming something otherwise. That is the first area of good assumption. The second area of good assumption is divided into two subcategories. One, while you are alive and healthy, and one, when you are on the verge of dying. In regards to the first one, it is that you believe that whatever you ask of Allah, and whatever happens to you, is actually for your own good. 
while you are alive. Assuming good about Allah means you have this good idea about Allah Azza wa Jal, but the scholars say that is for the person who is in the state of excellence. This is for the righteous slave. The righteous slave has the right to assume all the good things about Allah Azza wa Jal and all that everything that he makes in terms of dua, in terms of his ibadah, he has good assumption that everything is going good for him. As for the evil person, then he does not have that privilege. In fact, it works the other way around. So you see someone, we ask Allah to forgive us all, their whole life is just moving from one form of sinfulness to another. Just sinfulness upon sinfulness from the time they wake up until they go to bed and then you want to talk to him, he says, Ya Shaykh, Allahu Ghafur Rahim. Why are you saying that? I'm assuming good about Allah. Wrong answer. Not for you. Can't tell him that to his face, obviously. You need wisdom, but you should know that that's not for you. And the scholars consider this a form of mockery against Allah. It's like you're doing all these evil things and then you just want to say, oh, that's okay. I'm going to be fine. No. If that were the case, then all those who preceded us would have had this attitude and none of them had this attitude. While you are alive, while you are in your normal state, good assumption about Allah is for the one who makes, who strives. As for the one who's in the state of sinfulness, this is the one who has to assume that there's hellfire and then there's punishment and then there are calamities and all the things which should make a person afraid of Allah and return to Allah, those are the things that should come to mind. This is not the time to assume that everything is going to be dandy when you are at war with Allah on daily basis. Because we've seen what, Al what Allah has done to previous nations who acted this way, who behaved in this manner. So it's a very delicate matter. And we need to realize that when we are doing good, when we know we are doing good, this is when you don't let the shaitan make you despair from the mercy of Allah. This is when you have that confidence that Allah will forgive you. Allah promised that if you do certain acts, you have many ahadith, many, many different promises in the Quran and the Sunnah, that if you do this, you will be giving that. You don't want to be the one who says, I don't think so. I don't think Allah accepted of me. This is an evil assumption about Allah. No, assume good. Assume that Allah will accept your act of worship. Because if you assume good about Allah, then you will get exactly that. And if you assume that Allah will not accept it, then he won't be. Someone who did Hajj, for example. No matter what happened, if they want to assume that Allah will not accept their Hajj, it's almost like they've made a de decision. No Hajj for them. Assume good about Allah Azza wa Jal. In the second part of the khutbah, we will deal with the matter that has to do with the time of death. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. The second area where one should have a good assumption about Allah is at the time of death. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, لا يموتن أحدكم none of you should die except while he has a good assumption about Allah. And that applies to everybody. If one is at that moment of death, meaning one is maybe in an accident, they know they're gonna die, they're in a hospital, they know they're gonna die, whatever the condition may be. Once a person reaches that stage, they must assume good about Allah. So what they should bring to mind, as the scholars say, they should bring to mind that they are from the people of Tawheed, insha'Allah. And that the people of Tawheed have a special intercession and they have a special status with Allah. And that they will event, that they will go to Jannah, that Allah Azza wa Jal forgives the believer. And that a person comes on Yawm Al-Qiyamah with, with scrolls of sins 
and he will come with one ticket that says on it, La ilaha illallah. It will outweigh all of these evil deeds. <coughs> all of the, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man kana akhiru kal kalamihi, La ilaha illallah, dakhala al-jannah. Or kama qala alayhi wa sallam, whoever's last words before he departs is La ilaha illallah will enter jannah. A person should bring all of those to mind. No one should die <coughs> assuming that Allah Azza wa Jal will torture them. <coughs> The scholars say because if you were to have that good assumption, then Allah Azza wa Jal will show mercy to you. Allah is, is vast in mercy. Allah is kind and generous. And of course, what happens afterwards, the affair belongs to Allah. No one can judge. Humans will never know. But this is an expectation on our, on our part. It will, it's an expectation. And a lot of people, <coughs> At those last moments, because of the nature of their lifestyle and because they know that they have been at odds with Allah all these years, when they should be thinking good about Allah, they indulge in further sin. Now many examples of people who for example smoke and then they get in an accident or something and the last thing they want to do before they die is puff on a cigarette. Or they want to play their favorite music or they want to do whatever it is that they do. A lot of people that live in sinfulness, before they die, their last request is to do some more of that sin before they go away. Whereas the believer should have a different attitude. If Fir'aun, Fir'aun, among the biggest oppressors the world has ever known, when he was about to die and drown, he said, I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. He wanted to do tawbah. It wasn't accepted of him. Fir'aun knew what decision would be wiser. And what about a believer then? And this applies also to a person who may get into some sort of illness that suggests that he will have a short uh, uh, lifespan afterwards. And of course, it's all in the hands of Allah. But from a worthy point of view, from a medical point of view, they have an expectation then that person should strive, even if it's in that short phase of his life, to be the best slave he can be to Allah. Otherwise the shaitan will tell you, what a hypocrite. Your whole life you've been disobeying Allah. Now that you're sick, you want to be a good man? Yes. Exactly, yes. And that's better than continuing the way I have been until I die. It's common sense. But the shaitan has certain control over certain people that give him so much access that they think backwardly, they think illogically and they find logic in that. And these human beings are all over the world. What do you think atheism is a result of? It's the dumbest thing, it's the most ridiculous, outlandish, it's the craziest thing a human being can think of. But you have all these intellectuals today boasting about, you know, agnosticism and atheism and the fact that because this and because of that, like everything that is happening around us is some crazy coincidence. Satanic thoughts adopted by human beings, promoted to other human beings, and the victims are many. But a believer, always has a different outlook on things and a different attitude. So my brothers in faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us a lot about Himself in the Quran and through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is not a coincidence in any way, shape or form that in Surah Al-Fatiha, you begin by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The surah which you recite more than your name per day, more than your parents' name probably per day. The thing you repeat the most probably per day is Surah Al-Fatiha. And you're being reminded often that Allah is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim the most gracious, the most merciful. It could have been Al-Muntaqim, Al-Aziz Al-Muntaqim, the full of might, the revengeful. It could have been this one. It's one of the names of Allah, one of the qualities of Allah.
But Allah Azza wa Jal wants to show us His mercy. He wants to treat us with His mercy. Always keep that in the back of your mind. That should be the drive to be a better Muslim. And to continue to assume good about Allah. When we make dua, whether we get what we want or we don't, know that it is good. You will see it one day. When a calamity befalls you, assume good about Allah. Assume good about Allah that if Allah loves a slave, He will afflict him with calamities. And the most tested people were the prophets than those who are closer to them in righteousness, than those who are closer to them in righteousness. One should also have these ideas about Allah <coughs> instead of being negative altogether about everything. And Allah is superior and better. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub israf qulubana ala ta'atik. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم ارض عنا وتب علينا وتقبل منا واعف عنا واجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين وصلي اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين